We've been doing a series, and uh, it's called The Truth About. And I like to do series as which each particular teaching is a series unto itself, okay? And we've been doing the truth about, we did the truth about the coming of the Lord. We did the truth about mind renewal, how important it is to renew your mind. We did the truth about what is man, spirit, soul, and body. We've done a lot of different truths. So if I can encourage you, and those that are coming into the garage through uh, TV, is go ahead and all the outlines that I've done throughout the years have all been done in a nice uh, line out that you can put in the notebook and actually you can teach Bible study at your house and you can go through and look at the scripture and go back over it, you know. And I'm a real important person because when I first got saved, first thing my pastor told me, he says, you're going to have a struggle with the old way and the old mannerisms that you lived in and now that you're learning about the, the things of God, you've got to be a stickler for the word and prayer and softness of repentant heart. You can't ever get into a position as being a leader, being mad at people. Can you say amen? Because leaders influence a lot of people. Okay, so tonight and today's lesson is the truth about God's heart for us. And we're going to use as a text, we're going to use the woman caught in adultery. Now, there's some very important things that I want to bring out. We're also going to give you an illustration of why the law was given and the purpose of the law. And, you know, there's a lot of bad teaching out there, you know, on the law, what the law was for. Can we have the lights on? There we go in the back too. All right. Amen. So, so let's go ahead and get into this. Would you bow your hearts with me again as I, as I pray? Father, thank you again. Make the word rich to us. Speak to us, each one, individually. Father, let the eyes of our understanding become enlightened as you instruct us through your word. We welcome the Holy Spirit to be our guide and our teacher, our coach. We welcome the Lordship of Jesus Christ, Father, the gift of your Son. And we honor you, Father, and in your presence, make the word living to us, open our eyes, and help us to embrace the truth of the gospel so that we stay free in these days. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, all right, today we're going to look at the heart of the Lord concerning forgiving and restoring. Everyone say give forgiving, forgiving. And, restoring. and restoring. Something I believe us humans need to know more about. Our job was when you find someone, the scripture says in, in Galatians 6, if you find somebody that has a fault, you which are spiritual, you go and restore them. There's no such thing as you to go and tell them a thing or two. Can you say amen? So there's a lot of rich teaching within the body of Christ that Jesus imparted to his disciples. Could you imagine what it would have been like if after Jesus preached and taught and we're all sitting around the fire, you know, and people are partaking of food and Jesus begins to talk to people on a one-to-one -one basis. And he says, Peter, let's talk about your anger, Peter. You know, I think we as a church, we've been brought up in the word and the word is rich, word is perfect, I find no fault with it. But I, I think sometimes we need the Holy Spirit to bring us right down to the reality of the incident when it happened. And this is what I want the Holy Spirit to do when we look at Jesus confronting the religious people and the woman that was caught in adultery. But before we get there, I need to set the stage for you so that you can begin to see some of these things. So during this incident, Jesus reflected grace rather than law. Everyone say grace, grace. rather than law. Yeah. Now, didn't he come to fulfill the law? Yes. Okay. But yet we see in this instance, he's going to give grace and not, you know, hold the law up. So God, our father, did not come to judge the world. And I'm, this is something a lot of Christians still have to get. Okay, he didn't come to judge us, but only that the enemy, to judge the enemy and those that follow him. That's why in John 16 it says that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And then he clarifies of sin because we have not accepted Jesus Christ. Of righteousness 
because we go to establishing our own. And he says of judgment because, now listen carefully on this, the prince of this world, Satan, the devil, the bad guy, is, you know, the prince of this world is judged already. So if you look at that, how many of you remember the law? I know that Marvin, he used to be a police officer. Um, how many know there's guilty by association? You hang out with the wrong group just by you being around them sometimes can be thought that you're just another one of those hooligans. You know what I mean? And so the Bible wants us to know if we get to thinking, speaking, doing things that are anti-God, before we know it, the same judgment that is on the enemy can't slip over on us and yet you and I have been redeemed from the curse. So Christians, we found out last week that we are free and we're liberated if we walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Say amen, somebody. Okay, so go with me to John chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. Now remember, if this, this, this particular chapter is dealing with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious leader of the Jews. And he was supposed to know how the law worked and, and how eternal life worked, amen? And I'm going to say something, please don't get mad at me. But the Jewish people about the time when Jesus Christ showed up as Messiah, they were supposed to be telling the world that he's coming. The Jewish nation was supposed to be heralding the promises of Abraham. That the Messiah was coming and yet we find that they got caught up. Now please don't get, me, get mad at me, but we can all do this. Instead, they got caught up in what they were doing and they began to osterate certain people. They called the Samaritans dogs. And you see, really, I'm going to say this. I have to be careful because I have to clarify, but religion will cause divisions. Always cause divisions. So God doesn't really want you and I to become religious. He wants us to have a walk, walk, and one-on-one, face-to-face re- relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why the Father sent him. He said, Jesus said to Philip, you've seen me, Philip? You've seen the Father. Everything I do, everything I say, everything I am, I reflect my Heavenly Father to one ex- exceptional, perfect way. And the whole purpose of Jesus coming is because religion had a wrong idea of God. They took all their gatherings and writings of God and kind of put them all together. And But what came out at the end is you never know what God's going to do. And you know, our Christianity needs to be a little stronger than that. And religion, I tell you, Okay, let me just go into religion just a little bit more. Religion, let's, let's look at the positive end. The religious person who really is religious, I mean religious about God, are truly wanting to get to where God is. So you can look at, now don't get mad at me, but just you can look at all the religions of the world. Somewhere down and past the demonic deceptions and all that, somebody had an idea that I want to get to God. So if we can look at the noble thought of it, please don't cut me off here because I'm going to show you. Man can't reach God. That's why Jesus came to where man is. You see, all man's religion is man's effort to be good and to reach God. There's nothing wrong with that desire. But the deception is in our body, that is in our flesh, dwells no good thing. And so when we're religious, we try to approach God by something that has already been rejected, our flesh. And so we feel that God, well, he's really hard to deal with. So we go through calisthenics, we become religious. Okay? And it was the religious people of the day that didn't recognize Jesus. Now, think about it. In churches, I'm I'm going to stay on this for just a minute. In churches, sometimes people who are religious won't recognize the good in other people because the first thing they see is their fault. And we don't want that either, right? Can you say amen? Because everybody needs to find a home with God where they're accepted and loved and appreciated. Yeah? Uh, the church home has to be a place where we're challenged and to grow. We can't sit and ferment. 
But at the same time, we need to have the love of God. And so this whole teaching is to get God's heart and how he views everything that mankind is going through right now and why his perspective is absolutely perfect and how it heals, forgives, and restores. Shall I have a good time in the Word now? All right, so John 3 again. Let's look at what this part says in verse 14. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Whoop, I'm reading the wrong scripture. I am sorry. And, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now let me explain. The people of Israel got to complaining against Moses and got to complaining against the will of God. And when they did, remember, if you agree with the enemy, you get the enemy's blessing, curse really. Okay, and so they rose up and it says that serpents came into the camp. You get a chance to read it. You can read it later. Okay, and God, had, Moses went to God and said, what are we going to do? He says, Moses, you put a serpent on that brass pole and you hold it up and anybody that's been bitten by the serpent, gaze at the pole. I'm going to heal them. And I paraphrased a bunch and trying to keep it simple here. Okay, and you'll say, well, why did that work? Well, number one, remember in the back in the beginning when Moses was sent to Pharaoh and Aaron was along with him and he had a staff and he threw down the staff and it turned into a snake and of course Pharaoh's witches and warlocks threw down their staff and it turned into, you know, into snakes and the God's snake swallowed up the snake and the, which is a symbol of Jesus swallowing up our sin and the enemy's powers and, make, and rendering them ineffective to a believer. And so they were poisoned by their own mouth, their own attitude and then Moses was instructed to follow that and as they gazed upon Jesus on the pole. The serpent on, see, because Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin, Alan, that the righteous requirements of the law were fulfilled in him and we become the righteousness of God. Hello. So when Jesus is held up in our life, he swallows up all the negative effects of what the enemy tries to do to us. You see? And when he said, Moses says, well, Jesus lifted up the ser excuse me, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Yea. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not what? Perish, perish but have everlasting life. Okay? So we know Jesus came to save. But what many Christians don't know is verse 17 is right after 16. Look what it says. It says this, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be what? Saved. Saved. So the church is a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our job is not to be getting up and condemning everything. When we do that, we open up ourselves to serpents' lies. Everyone say positive attitude. Positive. Speak good things about others. Especially our government. <laughs> or don't say anything at all. Okay? Because our mouth, every idle word. See, Satan's crafty. He'll get you so covered and so overcome with looking at all that negative. Out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth is going to... Blah, 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 and then you're going to open a door and the enemy can get in there. So what do we do? Sharon, we lift up Jesus in our hearts and that cancels out. And we refocus watching that from now on. Why not? I mean, my goodness, why carry a bat around just to bang yourself on the head every time you're stupid? 
You'd be dead by this afternoon. No, I'm just joking with you. But you're getting the idea. Now let me read 1 Timothy. Look at what Paul writes to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1, verses 14 through 16. Sorry, I, I bounced the scripture. But this one, listen. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. Do you say amen to that? Yeah. With faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Then Paul says, of whom I am chief. Verse 16 says, Whoever, uh, however, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in, the fir- that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering and a pattern to those who are going to believe on him through everlasting life. What did Jesus come to do? Save. What is the church here for? To save. To reach out in the Great Commission, to reach out beyond ourselves and not build our churches, not build our name, not brag about ourselves, but get out there and touch the lost. Really, that's really our first commission, isn't it? Now you say, well, I'm doing my best. That's all God requires you. You you not keep quiet about all the good things God has said about you. And you'll find out. Let me just testify. One time I came back from a full gospel businessman fellowship. And I was so full of God. And I'm driving through Enoquah because it was at Lake Wilderness out there on the golf course. I'm driving through Enoquah and God says, speaks up in my spirit. Now, I must say you have to make sure things like what I'm about to tell you is God. And not just my well-wishing head, you know what I mean? And he says, I want you to drive over to the Lee Hotel... And I want you to walk in there and I want you to sit down and order a Coke. Now, I'm minding my own godly business, driving through Enoch, singing and rejoicing. I'm just, the sense of humor of God is so beautiful. I says, okay, God, I'm going to do it. But you know, that's a bar and there's Klingons in there. And he says, yeah, but greater see that's in you. So I'm making a long story short. I went in, I sat down, ordered a Coke. And now this guy came out of the bathroom. He sat down next to me and there was a bartender. So it was the bartender and myself and I'm drinking a Coke. And the bartender says, uh, what you here for? And I says, I'm here to share my testimony. I just want to tell you all the good, you know, they didn't tell me to shut up or get out. So I just want to tell you all the good things that God has done for me through these years that I am so amazed and so taken back that he would care for for me like this. And I wasn't sharing anything. I wasn't getting loud like sometimes I do and all that. I talked about God providing my socks, my underwear. I mean, I just went into the, you know, silly things. How God provides every little thing for me. Then I noticed the guy that was sitting next to me got up and went to the bathroom again. And the bartender's mouth was hanging open. (laughs) Because, you know, when you're talking, sometimes you're not looking at who you're talking to sometimes. And you're just trying to remember it all. And I looked up, and he, I absolutely, God had arrested his, his being. And then the guy come out of the bathroom staggering. And he sat down, and he says, you'll never believe what happened to me. I went into the bathroom, and God began to speak to me and shook me, and I fell on the floor. <laughs> okay, now. Why did you share all that? I want to share that God wants us to bring him out in our conversation. Let me caution you. Don't have to prove God. Don't try to prove God. Somebody says, you know, I don't want to hear that right now. He says, well, I just can't help it. He does so many good things for me. Okay. But a lot of times we get into wanting to prove God. And God says, I'll prove myself. You just talk about me. And I can go through story after story after story after story because back in those days, I didn't have a whole lot to preach. I hadn't been fully trained yet. I just had a testimony and things that God was doing good in me. And this is for you, Tina. The good things that God is doing for you are very important for other people to hear. That's it, right. Overcome by the blood of the Lamb and, amen, and the word of our testimony. Absolutely. So a couple of points I want to give you before we move on to my next point. <coughs> Sorry, I had a cough. One point. Now, remember the curse, okay? 
Remember the curse of the Israelites brought into the camp because they spoke against God. As a Christian, don't ever speak against God nor other Christians. It's just not worth it. Okay? We don't know what they're going through. If you don't like somebody up the street, just be quiet. Smile. If you can say anything, oh yeah, they're good people. You might not know fully or not, but you can't be accused of anything that way. If you're only speaking good of people and you don't know what to say, just say something really good and change the subject. Yeah. Why? Because it gives nothing for the devil to work with you about. Nothing to be browbeaten or guilt or somebody to accuse you. It just cuts them in a good way right off of your life. Can you say amen? The second thing is God our Father gave his son to save the world, not to condemn it. Yet we have people out there having false prophecies and judgment's going to start and they're going to do this. And you want to know what that really is? That is really a state of confusion that Satan's, Satan's building up. Because all prophecy must be in scripture. If it's not agreeing with scripture, then it is not necessary a false prophecy but it is not a biblical prophecy. So all prophecy much agree with scripture and will never lead you in the New Testament. Listen to me carefully. It will only confirm God leading you. So if you knew you were, most, you were to move to Alaska and you were going to start a new ministry there, God along the line would confirm it yeah. with many people saying the same thing over and over and over again to you. But if somebody says, no, you're to sell your dog, you're to give the money to me, and God saith the Lord. I'm trying to make it sound so ridiculous that you get the simple point. There's a lot of false prophecies rolling around right now on YouTube and stuff, and they're not biblically based. So be careful of that. Okay, that's all I want to say. Be careful. If it doesn't bear witness to the God in you, smile and say, ah, shelve it. Shelve it. It's not that important. What's important to God? Now, everyone say, what is it, Pastor? Everyone say, what's important to God? You. You. You're the most important thing to God. Well, what about her? She's the most thing, important thing about God. God's a personal God, too. And we, as the church, have got into this fight that you and I can't win. Jesus already won it. Isn't that ridiculous? If Jesus smashed the enemy over 2,000 years ago, what are we doing like beating the air and sharing everybody our opinion? We got to be careful. All right. Third thing is God is in the restoring grace business. You're broken. If he can and you let him, he'll restore you. You've blown it. You think it's the worst thing anybody ever could have done in their life. God is in the restoring business. God is not in the condemning business. God is not pointing his finger. He knows everything. God is not the accuser. The devil is. So when people start accusing you, you know who they're listening to. I know this is good teaching. But I, I'm, I'm buzzing with the Spirit of God on me, really strong, and I'm, I think God really want, want, want God, I want us to get the point. The point is, he did not come to this world to destroy it. He's going to put the Antichrist and everything in its place in his time. But he wants you and I as good sheep to pay attention to the shepherd. He says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will teach you about the things of God and about the love of God. And so that your personal walk becomes enriched. Amen. Okay, next, my first point for tonight. Actually, from a Jewish perspective, again, I sure love the Jewish people. They're so sweet. They brought the Messiah forth. So I, I never want to really get into picking on them, but they got picked on and up by God. Did you know that? God laid on them really good because they were missing some basic things. So I can quote God about the Jews. Please don't fault me because I'm not a Jew hater or what do they call it? I forget what they call it. Anyway, so listen. From a Jewish perspective against unfaithfulness, the Jews had this understanding that being unfaithful to each other was punishable by death. Being unfaithful 
faithful to God was punishable by death. So they had this really great understanding that we ain't leaving Judaism for nothing. And they got so religious about it, when the Messiah came to liberate them, they crucified him. And let me say this point to you and never forget it. The world will kill everything good. If you let it. Satan is the god of this world. He still runs the system. Jesus is here, yes, but you know getting with Jesus has got to be your voluntary basis. Jesus didn't force himself on anyone. But more of him is here in this planet than anything the enemy's doing. But this is the enemy's time. These are the last days. So his job is to make the biggest, darkest, dirtiest smoke screen that he can. Meanwhile, you and I could care less. Why? Because we're marching with God. We listen to a new drum beat, a different trumpeter. We have different marching orders. But the Jewish people will caught up into the religion part. Now listen to this. Romans 7, listen to the instruction Paul gives to the Jewish people. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. I got to take a sip here. For the woman who has, has a husband is bound, bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then while her husband lives, she marries another, she will be called an adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Jesus Christ. He's not really talking about marriage. He's talking about how the Jewish people are so married to the law, the whole thought of leaving the law and the covenant is like death. So no wonder it was so hard to, read, to lead Jewish people to the Lord. They thought they were going to die and be punished by God, not knowing that Jesus came to fulfill all the demands of the law. Now, yeah, it is finished, and we're going to actually get to that part here in a minute. But if you think about that, same Holy Ghost says, but if you think about that, you think about that, we get we, a lot of Christians today, and again, I'm not trying to pick on any of them, but we get the, the law and grace all intermixed with each other. They get the law going, they get the mix, and you know, I'll fight, pray harder. God will favor me longer, and, and if I give more, God will give me more back. You know, that's the law, folks. Knife and eye, tooth for tooth, give, should be given. When Jesus says, when you're to love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and this is love your neighbor as yourself, right? That was the Old Testament. How many know that some people don't love themselves at all? So they're not going to love their neighbor. So Jesus popped in a new one. He says, love your neighbor as I have loved you. New Testament. But we Christians get those all mixed up all the time. And so we're trying to live Old Testament principles back in the New Testament. And we find ourselves getting under bondage again. Paul addresses it in Colossians. He says, why do you go back to the beggarly elements of the world? Uh, studying Sabbaths and holidays and, and making everybody convey to that. These are all bondages. They're all shadows of things to come. Jesus. Jesus fulfilled all that. So, you might say, well, what's it so important? It's very important because Christians are still trying to follow the law under grace. We have whole groups of them waving flags and, and dancing around. I think that's beautiful. But a lot of them, you ask them why they're doing it, and they can't tell you. Sounds like a lot of political people I know. <laughs> but anyway, catch this. So then, if while her husband lives and she marries another man, she's an adulteress, though she marry another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have 
become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another. To him who is raised from the dead and we should bear fruit to God. So when we were in the flesh, the simple passions that are, are, are which are aroused by the, I have to look at this word, I got a red line going through my notes. It says, we're aroused by the law, we're at work in our members. In other words, so what the law said was, Peggy, you can't save yourself. Oh, yes, I can. And that's what happened. Remember when you told your kids, don't cross that line? When you weren't looking, they did? You see, because rebellion is born in the heart of a child. So what do we do? We bring that person and submit it to God on a daily basis so God puts that fleshly part down. Amen. So the law was designed, revive sin in us. What did Paul say? Before the law came, I was alive. But when the law came, it slew me. Not the law itself, but the sin that was in me slew me. Because now I knew the speed limit sign said 35 and I was doing 70. So the law was given to let us know what God expected. That we can't save ourselves. But he was going to send a savior. And he was going to enter our hearts. And he was going to fulfill the law. It is finished. And he's going to lift us up into a higher plane. And as long as we don't get distracted. And we pay attention to follow him. We will get out of here. And you will be rewarded greatly but if you get caught up in the world and get all that kind of stuff what did John say John says he knew John the beloved remember he's the guy they couldn't kill he's sitting there splashing around and he'd say something like this love not the world nor the things that are in the world for if anyone loved the world the love of the father is not in him now, what in the world is he talking about? He says, don't love Satan's worldly system. Gambling, exposure, all of these things that corrupt. What? You can love fishing. You like to hunt? Love hunting. That's not what he's talking about. If you like to have a vacation, that's not what he's talking about. He said, don't get, get caught up in the monetary system of this planet because Satan is running it right now. And if you do, you cannot serve two masters. Either you will love the one or hate the other, or you will hate the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and the world system, mammon. Mammon there does not just mean money. It means the world system of exchange. I know people who would kill their mother for 10 bucks so they can get a hit of drugs. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not evil. It's the person has it. Who do they serve? Okay, moving right along. So he says, look, but now that Jesus died, rose again, you Jewish people, your, your law has died. Now, let me... Let me caution us. First of all, the law was not done away with. The law was fulfilled in Christ. It's very important you use that terminology because some people have a fit if you say, well, Jesus done away with the law. No, Jesus fulfilled the law and he did do away with the portion of it. Can anybody tell me what that portion is? Come on, you biblical scholars. You have to really think about it. He got rid of the curse of the law. The law still remains. As a reminder, we can't save ourselves. But the curse from not obeying the law has been removed. Jesus removed the curse. As is written, cursed, everyone, cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Amen. So therefore, guess what? Curses are not for believers. Curses are not for believers. But if you're going to go act like the devil for two weeks, you're going to taste a few. But God didn't do it. You did it on your own. And boy, I, I, I can tell you from someone that has bumped the bottom a couple of times, not good. So you say amen. All right, let's go on. Are you having fun with me? All right, I hope you do. I got a couple points I want to share with you on this. Okay, I noticed that my other outlines didn't go up to Danny. Does he have them? Okay. 
One, point one, the Jews were bound by the law to keep it. Those who broke the law suffered many afflictions and even death. Can you tell me why? Did you know I'm amazed at Christians? You guys know this. But I'm amazed at Christians that can't tell you why God seems different in the Old Testament and different in the New Testament. And it's really a simple answer. It's not a hard answer. In the Old Testament, Messiah wasn't born yet. So God had to do everything he could to get, make sure that Satan didn't ruin the fact Messiah was going to be born. So he put, protected the blood level, the bloodline. So it doesn't matter if you were Jew, Gentile, bond, free, doesn't matter. If you came against that plan, you were treated as an enemy. Now, the difference is in the New Testament, we have Messiah. Messiah died, rose again, sits at the right hand. Not only that, we have something nobody else has. We have God living in us. Oh my goodness. And most Christians haven't got a clue what that really means. We're still learning. And I'm not putting anybody down. You're still understanding that, aren't you? I mean, if you're really honest, you're still understanding how powerful God really is on you. Now, the key is God is a gentleman, so as much room as you yield to him, he'll take. But if you don't give him any room, he'll sit there off on the side of the corner of your life, hardly doing anything because you won't let him be God. He's a gentleman. And gentlemen, if you don't want him in the house, they'll leave. Everybody say, more of God, less of me. More of God, less of me. More of God, less of me. Hallelujah. Amen. You guys are champions. Don't let anybody talk you out of that. And love one another and build one another up. Okay, so second point I want to give you is when the wife of a husband is freed by his death, she is freed to marry another. When namely Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, he's freed us from the law, freed the Jews from the law. Now they are free to marry our Lord Jesus Christ. How many times have you heard me say, stop dating Jesus, Christians? Whenever you get in trouble, you go pray and you you behave better. We don't want you to date Christ. We want you to marry him. You see, I can't tell my wife, hey, honey, I'm going for two weeks. Well, you didn't tell me. That's tough news. Uh, I'll see you later on when I get stinky and catch some fish and I need to repent. I mean, no, you can't have a marriage like that. You can't have a relationship with God that way either. Pray every day and talk to him. Be in the word every day, just a little bit. to Keep your perspective right. You got to be plumb and level. Can you say amen? And without meeting with God every day, you won't be plumbs right on, and you won't be level. You'll be and the more you're like that, the more you become. Hello. Because God is the only one that has the power to keep you in line as you yield yourself to him. All right, let's go on. Listen to the third point. Why was the law added, folks? Did you know Abraham received the promises of God 430 years before Moses got the law? So the promises of God are still going. The promises of Abraham are still upon those that believe in Christ. God just got rid of the curse part. Hello? Hello? Yeah, oh boy, it's exciting. So, <clears throat> why was a law added? Well, I kind of told you, but let's see what the book of Galatians says. In verse 19, Galatians 3, what purpose does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come, Jesus, to whom the promises were made. And it was appointed through the angels by the hand of a mediator, Moses. Not a mediator does not mediate for one only. Mediates for more than one. Now a mediator does not mediate, a mediator, not a mediator. A mediator does not mediate for one only. But God is one. 
There's only one God. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given that could give us eternal life and truly righteousness could have been done by that law, but it couldn't be. But the scripture has confirmed all under sin and that the promises of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe that are not under the law, but under grace. Can you say amen? Amen. So what happens a lot of times is we're trying to be good because we don't want to get in trouble. And we're fitting, forgetting that God's already forgiven us and already is walking with us. Our little, it's like a little two-year-old old that pulled over your, your canister, knocked over your garbage can, made a terrible mess. You stop loving that child. You pick it up and go, what a mess. And you love it. Hello. What a mess, folks. What a mess. So, let God love us and restore us and help us. So, let's see God's attitude towards the woman caught in adultery. Let's see the view of the law, the religious. Let's see the view of Jesus. Remember, Jesus represents the Father. So, everything Jesus did, everything Jesus does, says, all is the Father's will for us. So in John chapter 8, 1 through 12, and we'll finish. But Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives. Remember, I gave you a real, on Wednesdays, we get into some really good meat. But we told you on the Mount of Olives, when Jesus was really talking to his disciples, Mount of Olives looks right over to Jerusalem, remember? To the Eastern Gate and the, the Dome on the Rock and all. Okay, so Jesus was at, went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, I got to take a drink here. Early in the morning, and he came again to the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, who? What was a scribe? A secretary. They wrote notes. And Pharisees, what was a Pharisee? They were a religious doctor of the day that added lots of rules and regulations to the Christianity. That's why they were fair, you see. Just kidding. All right, so, yeah. Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this is a woman caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? It's a trick, isn't it? Now you got to look at that. Where did they find the woman? She was having sex with somebody. Right in the very act. That's what it says. Not probably. So these dirty so-and-sos in the name and under the guise of the law, had to be peeping toms. Alan, peeping through the window. Now, are they breaking the law? You better believe they are. Well, one justifies the other when you're breaking the law. See, this is how mad the world is and how mad it's going to get in this day and age, too. What's evil is good, and what's good is evil stuff. So, <laughs> then it says, and they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus just stooped down, wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. I don't know what he wrote. Nobody knows what he wrote. But I think the idea that he had no, he didn't bother to even listen to those who are demanding the law. What did Jesus came to do? Fulfill the law. Neutralize its effect. Give grace instead of judgment. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. So, when they continued asking him, they wouldn't let up. He raised up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. Now, folks, how many know as a man sows, 
so shall he reap. So I don't know if you've ever caught yourself doing something to somebody and then all of a sudden about a day later it came back right on you. And if you haven't got any recollections, let me get, just encourage you not to go out and try it. Amen. Because God always recompenses. He's the recompenser. He's always the righteous judge. Don't take matters in your own hand. Somebody calls you a name, don't call them a name back. Just smile at them and say, oh well, take it up with Jesus. Don't let it become an offense to you. Why? Because you're better than that. Moving right along. Okay. So they continued asking him. So he wrote on the ground. Then he rose up and he said, you without sin cast the what? What happened? From the oldest to the youngest. Okay. Then those that heard it being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning from the oldest to the, to, la, to, the la, to the least. And Jesus was left alone and the woman. And he said to her, Woman, where are you, our accusers? Now, was she guilty? Yes. Had she been doing it a long time? Yes. But did Jesus come to condemn the world? No, he came to save people like that. Yet the law, religious people thinking they know what the law is demanding, want to judge her and kill her before God has a chance to release her. Look at the church today, folks. I have people still mad at me for some reason. And yet Jesus forgives them. Don't be mad at anybody. Forgive everybody. But it, listen, if it's a dog that bites, don't get by the dog again. All right. So when Jesus had raised himself up, he said, you without sin cast the first stone. Woman, he said, where are your accusers? And, and has no one condemned you? Jesus came not into this world to condemn the world. Amen. All right? Is it speaking to you? Do you see how God looks at these people? He looks up them as a real mess. But if he doesn't look at them in love and he just feeds that fear, he'd wipe us all out in a second. Saying, I'm tired of them all. Anyway, thank God. God is loving and he's merciful. Then Jesus spoke to, uh, I love this. And they said, no one, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. He's saying, look it, if you follow me, you're not going to commit adultery. You'll be so caught up in me, you won't be thinking about defilement. You'll be so caught up, listen, I'm going to throw this out. You'll be so caught up in God, you won't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend that doesn't love your Jesus. You won't put up with it. They have a different God than you, and that means that they're hugging on you, they're sliming on you. You need to look a little bit wiser about life and don't just sweep things under the carpet. Now, this is our Father's heart. When you make a mistake... How is he going to deal with you? Is he going to slap you silly? Or is he going to love you and restore you? Okay, but you got to help him. How do I help the Lord to restore me? Admit that you need help. And ask him for it. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Put your hand on the heart if you will. There's nothing wrong with repeating a prayer after me. Just mean it with your heart. I'm going to lead you in a prayer asking God to help you, okay? You ready for that? I want you to, if, with all your heart, say, Dear Heavenly Father, cleanse me from all sin. If I have held odd against anybody, cleanse me. Lord, I let go of the world's troubles and all the things that you care about. And I give them to you, Lord. I cast the care of it over on you. Now I ask you to help me 
Change my life. Change me, Lord. Make me into a better personal relationship Christian with you. Can you remember that? Make me into a better Christian for you. I ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And I open my heart now for that to begin. In Jesus' name. Amen.